continuation of the speaker program. Um, <coughs> this afternoon, um, George Calacotti is here, who works for, you have seen before, he works for the Worshipful Company of Information Technologists, who's one of the sponsors of the school. And he's been good enough to um, organise this speaker this afternoon. And I'm really pleased to welcome um, Dame Stephanie Shirley here to talk to you. Um, better known as Steve. I, when I heard about this talk, I must admit that I, I um, with all due respect, I, mean, I have not heard of you, but the more research I did into, into your, uh, your, his, your life history and your background, it really intrigued me. Um, and this is what you're going to be learning more about this afternoon. I know a lot of you are studying ICT, a lot of you are studying business, and these two are key elements in Steve's life. So it's going to be really, really um, interesting for you, and it is something that you will be able to bring in different parts of that to your the courses that you study. Thank you. So, with more, without more ado, I will pass you over to George and Steve. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, my apologies. I'm going to have to use a microphone. I have a rare and exotic voice condition called spasmodic dysphonia and I'm just recovering from some treatment so I can't actually speak very loud. If you can't hear me, shout and then there's a magic box over there that can make me louder without my having to strain. So welcome to this, which is the second in a series of talks that's being organised by the Worshipful Company of Information Technologists to give us our full title or WCIT for short. Now, WCIT is the 100th city livery company, and it has had a close relationship with William Bayliss since October 2002. Livery companies, as some of you may know, were originally trade associations, although nowadays they have a significant focus on charitable work. In addition, WCIT focuses on education and the reason we're here, industry and fellowship. I'm George Calacotti, as John said. I'm very impressed you got the pronunciation of Calacotti right. Uh, there are many various versions of it, but that's the correct one. I'm a liveryman, so I don't actually work for WCIT. I'm, if you like, a volunteer. So you get invited to become uh, a freeman. Uh, which gives you the right to drive your sheep over on the bridge at 6 o'clock in the morning, although I've never exercised it. Um, and then you become a liveryman. And if you uh, keep going, then if you look closely, um, Dame Stephanie is wearing a badge which says, Past Master. In fact, Dame Stephanie was the first female master of a livery company. 1992. Um, I'm um, a sponsor governor of Lillian Bayless, as is Jeff McMullen, who I think a number of you have also met. Um, I'm an ex-pupil of the Beaufoy School, which is one of the three schools that combined to form Lillian Bayless. I do feel a very close affinity to many Lillian Bayless pupils, having come to the UK at the age of 13 from a much warmer country, in my case, Cyprus, and speaking not a word of English. And if any of you say nothing has changed, I'd be very upset. Um, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to Dame Stephanie Shirley, um, our speaker today. She asked me to adopt a question and answer format. Um, so I will first ask a few questions and then I'll ask you for any questions you have. So my job is to be a friendly version of Jeremy Paxman, I think. The mind really does buckle. Um, Dame Stephanie is much better known as Steve Shirley for reasons that will become clear shortly, but not quite yet. She, can best, she had what can best be described as a traumatic childhood, having been evacuated from Vienna in 1939 at the age of five with her older sister, but without her parents. Steve has had an eventful life, and you can read a very honest and moving account in her book, Let It Go, which is in the school library. Um, 
You'll have noticed three copies there. They will be signed by Steve. And if you are good enough, work hard enough, and uh, use your imagination enough, then you may be lucky enough to get one of those as a prize later on. So you may have your own copy. It is very much worth reading. I've read it, and I was absolutely riveted by it. Steve is a true entrepreneur and pioneer. She did set up a very successful woman-friendly software company while doing her best for her severely autistic son. When Steve started a company with just six pounds, it was at a time when a woman needed her husband's permission to open a bank account. Can you imagine that? When the company floated, it created 70 millionaires amongst its employees and made Steve, I think this is correct, but I'm sure she'll correct me if it's wrong, the 40th most wealthy woman in Britain. The company was female friendly by design. It had a flexible, home based, job sharing, share owning, trust the staff environment. Nowadays, many would see most of these as obvious and necessary conditions for success. When Steve did this, it was a true pioneering. There were significant innovations. In recent years, Steve has focused her energies and talents on charitable causes, in particular charities related to autism. She gave five million to WCIT, but she has given many times that amount to many other charities. To get the ball rolling, I'm going to ask Steve a few questions and then I'm going to invite you to ask questions. So you may want to be thinking about the questions you'd like to ask. I am planning um, to um, close with a final question, unless of course one of you asks my final question for me, in which case I'll be a bit lost. But I'm not going to tell you what the final question is. So, um, Steve, tell us why you changed your name and why you have not gone back to your original name. Well, I'm very proud of my dame ship, which is the female version of a knighthood. Unfortunately, my husband doesn't get the equivalent of a, of a lady title that, uh, that would apply the other way around. But the uh, reason for the change of name, it was a family nickname to be Steve, and I was so early in as a woman in business, that nobody replied to my business development letters, sales letters, um, which I was signing Stephanie Shirley, a double feminine. And at that time, that really, you know, women were expected to be home, at home and bake bread. And I got no response at all. And my husband, of now of over 50 years, uh, suggested that I use the family nickname and start signing as Steve Shirley. And it seemed as if I began to get some more response, and I began to get some meetings, and because I had a good story to tell, uh, the business started to take off. And I've been Steve ever since. It reminds me of those decades where women really did have enormous difficulty. Uh, they, people complain about anti-sexism uh, uh, today, but to me, you guys have it so easy compared with what we had. You were not allowed to drive a bus, you couldn't work on the stock exchange, you couldn't, as uh, Chairman said, open a bank account on it without your husband to the mission. It really was a second class citizen thing. And recently I've been working in Saudi Arabia, and there again women are very much second class citizens, and I'm conscious that for them they've never met anyone like me. Whereas nowadays in Britain, we have things good, and that's how it should stay. But each of us has to move that forward. Um, now, anyone reading your book can't fail to realize that you are very highly motivated and indeed driven. What part do you think your early childhood played in your becoming so driven and successful? And do you think you would have been as successful if you had had what some might call a more normal childhood? I come from a fairly intellectual family. Uh, my father was a very young judge near Berlin when there was enormous anti-Semitism and um, the bad times began and we had to start moving around Europe to be safe at least. 
So I don't think success, however you define success, depends on a traumatic start. When we all have children, we just hope that our children have the easiest, the happiest, the lovely life that they, they could possibly have. And yet it is hardship that, that sort of forges the kernel of each person. And the person that you are now, and the person that you will be at my age, I'm 80 in a couple of years, a couple of months, um, is really forged very early. I came as an unaccompanied child refugee to this country without parents, but with my older sister, without language, without nationality, because Hitler had taken nation nationality away from Jewish families, and of course with no money at all. And I was cared for by a lovely uh, middle-aged family uh, couple in the Midlands of England who had no idea how to bring up children but I settled in and basically I am their child. But the drive, how could, how could what, what happened with a dramatic start like that? I was very conscious that I was very lucky. Everybody told me how lucky I was. Uh, but I was conscious also that I wasn't just the victim of bigotry and, and a hardship. But I'd been helped by so many people, Christian people, Jewish people, Quakers who kept the refugee system going uh, when it ran out of money, lots and lots of volunteers. And you finish up with a realization, so much has saved me and got me going. I really have to make it a life that's worth saving. And I know it sounds a bit smug, but I really try not to fritter each day away. Uh, I'm now very wealthy, but I try always to do something worthwhile with the money and with my time and skills. I mentioned my father because it's obvious that I did actually have quite a high intellect. But it's not that that has made me successful. It's the emotion of being able to cope with hardship, being able to pick yourself up when you've made a mistake, as we all do, and move on, leaving the, the bitterness behind. I was fairly bitter until I was about 30, so it was a long time. Then gradually, I think as I became happier, and more stable, uh, less poor, um, I began to feel, feel good about myself. And I wish that had happened earlier. Thank you, Steve. Um, one of the things we have in common is that we would be classed in this school if we were here uh, as EAL, English as an additional language. And this school does have a very high proportion of pupils for whom English is an additional language. So you mentioned you came, age of five, speaking not a word of English, um, different culture. What were the challenges you had to overcome to adapt to the English way of life? And as a supplementary question, which country do you think of nowadays as being your home country and why? Well, at five, you pick up language very, very quickly. I arrived on the 6th of July, 1939, and I went to my first little village school uh, in September, and my English was fine. Because you pick up very, very quickly. I refused to speak my native language of Germany. I was so hurt and damaged. Um, and I, even when I went to the German embassy, I refused to speak German, and German to me is the second language now. I think of myself very much as a Brit. Um, England took 10,000 refugees in at that time. There's a little plaque in the House of Commons um, saying thank you to them. We've just had a 75th anniversary uh, of their, that largest ever migration of children, 10,000 children, uh, in a very short period, the end of 1939. And to me, Britain has been a saviour. It has been, I mean, I used to sort of burst into tears when I saw the white just of Dover because I felt safe again. Uh, I refused to go to Germany for many, many years, and then eventually I did realise that one had to reach out and remake relationships 
between a country that now has to live with the history of the Holocaust. And when I went to Saudi, there was something very similar there, because the Saudis have to live with the history of 9-11, and that goes on for generation and generation. So these are very basic things that define a person. I am British through and through, and I'm very clear about that. Thank you. Um, when I was driving to the school, I live out in the States near Guildford. I was listening to Sue and to Kirsty Young um, uh, interviewing you for Desert Island Discs. And by the way, Desert Island Discs, if you're not familiar with it, you can go onto the Radio 4 website and look for um, Steve Shirley and you will find that program and you can listen to it online and that goes into an MP3 player. So I was sort of preparing myself and revising for this. Um, one of the, the points that comes out is that you've said um, all the money I have let go has brought me infinitely more joy than the money I have hung on to. Um, some might find that quite difficult, especially if they don't have much money. Can you elaborate on that? Can you tell us why that is the case? I don't think I will ever forget being poor. And one of the drivers for me was not to make wealth, not to make money, but not to be poor anymore. And one of the big decisions I had in my life at the, at the age of 18, which I think is coming up for you soon, um, was whether to go to university or not. And I was so fed up of being dependent on charity and having to say thank you all the time that I decided I wanted to start working and I got a reasonable sort of apprentice time job uh, at 18. And, and it was fine. But I've always regretted that, and I've had a chip on my shoulder for a long time because I hadn't been to university and had those three years of not only intellectual development, but actually being between your childhood and adulthood. It's a wonderful opportunity if you can have it, and I passed it by, and I do regret it. Um. Now, you have contributed very large amounts of money to charity. In fact, you're a big coy when you're in the just about the amount, but it is a very large amount. Um, perhaps predictably, I mentioned in my introduction that um, you don't do things conventionally, so you didn't set up a conventional company, you set up a very unconventional company, which nowadays would be seen as a model of how to do things in many, many respects. Um, so, predictably, you developed your own way of giving to charity. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the way that you do that, the way that you incentivize charities to um, make the most of your donations? Well, I gather you're doing a debate later on this afternoon, and the very first charity that I supported was a debating society in, as it happens, Bermuda. Why? Because I had a friend there, I knew her very well, I knew she wouldn't put her hand in the till, I knew she would spend the money well, and so I sponsored a debating society in, in, in Bermuda, which has a very poor indigenous population. But when, sorry, what was the question, giving to charity? When I began to really think about what am I doing, I decided to use my business skills and focus on the things I know and care about. And there are only really two. Uh, information technology, which is my professional discipline, and autism, which is my late son's disorder. And so I focused on those, and I sort of said, how do I make it effective? And I decided to be pioneering. I like to do new things. I like to make new things happen. So it's always pioneering, never more the same, no matter how worthy, and strategic. And what do I mean by strategic? I mean something that makes a real difference in the sea of me. There is so much that there's no use just pouring money into 50 pounds here, 100 pounds there. You really have to focus it. And so I've got very involved in the charities that I've set up, and they are largely focused on autism, but a fair bit on the Oxford Internet Institute, which is more modern computing than when I started. Thank you, Steve. Now this is the part of the afternoon where I'm going to invite you to ask questions. Maybe I should have forewarned you um, before I ask the last question. 
So do we have any questions? Now when I was in Saudi, the, 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 the sexes are, are separated, and I spoke to some very large medical audiences, and the women were sort of all doing sort of high in some balcony, all wearing the black buyers and so on. And they were the matrons and the nurses and the occupational therapists, absolutely fine. And when it came to it, they wouldn't ask questions in front of the men. Well, that's a different culture. They're trying to do it in 50 years what Europe has taken, 250 years. And so we then started running uh, women-only discussion groups. And um, they came in still in their black immediately stripped off to show the most beautiful clothes on front of them. And were as educated and active and lively and interested as any audience. But they wouldn't speak in front of the men. Now how can women move on like that? You've got to actually have the confidence. And I can remember you know, being in meetings and thinking, my voice is going to squeak compared to all the male voices. So you have to have that confidence to ask Say, I don't understand that, I don't know, tell me more, how can I find out? Very basic questions that we've got to do all the time. And you go on doing it all your life if you're learning. And I, I'm a learning person, I'm learning things every day. So I guess one of the differences with Saudis is that the very first hand I went to have is at the back, female, would you? As you think about your next question, I, I'm going to ask you a question. So, Steve, this is your autobiography. Um, as I say, I have read it cover to cover and I was fascinated. When you were at school, when you were this sort of age, um, did you ever imagine you would write your own autobiography? And if you did, when did you start thinking about writing an autobiography? And how long did it take you to actually get round to doing it? And then how long does it take to write? So, got a lot of questions all in one. I certainly would never have guessed when I was young that I would have anything to write about at all. Um, I'm a scientist. Uh, British Library has got masses of recording on me of the various scientific things that I've been involved with. But, so I would tend to think if I was writing anything, they were factual, scientific papers. I've got quite a few under my name. So very exciting. When I'm married, I almost thought, should I not take my husband's name? Because I've got some papers written at an academic level uh, in, in my maiden name. And luckily, I made the right decision and uh, did change to my husband's name. The feeling that I might start thinking about the legacy is part of this business of having been a refugee, how do I make sure that my life 
was one that was worth saving. And you start thinking, well, what difference am I going to be? What difference am I going to make in the world? Because I was saved, that wouldn't have happened if I had died like a million and a half other children in that Holocaust. And you start thinking about the Holocaust, um, you start thinking about legacy. And some of the legacy is comes through your children. The biggest thing a woman can ever do um, to rear a family. Uh, some of the legacy comes from scientific achievements and so on. Not much of it from money, but in fact the money did start rolling in. After 25 years, nothing happens easily. And I had a really sort of, what am I going to do with this money? And I decided to use it in the same way as business, that it was going to be something that was worthwhile, business-like, that was professional, and I suppose the thought that it was worth writing about came about 10 years ago, actually. People had often suggested it, oh, you have such an interesting lifestyle, you know, you, you really have something to do. Um, but I didn't have time. When I eventually got round to it, um, and I would also sort of say, I don't want to write my life story, because it didn't finish yet. Still got serious, significant things to do. But um, when I got round to it, it took me two years, not full time, of course. It was when I was not too tired at the end of the day's work, and I was still not effectively full time. And I would dictate, and I had a, a journalist, uh, Richard Asquith, whom I had met, um, I don't know who was actually said, written with Richard Asquith, and he turned all my dictation into decent English, and um, would also act as a bit as an editor, you know, you need more about this, or can you go back about that? And um, it, I'm glad I did it when I did. Uh, when I read it now, I think, oh, I'd forgotten that. I, I would have forgotten the name in a few years' time. Um, so uh, it was a task that was, I think, to me, worth doing. And it's a task that I hope will encourage other people to think of money as something that we have in trust for society. It's not something just to spend. We can use it for good or ill, um, but there it is. It's, it's in our power um, to use it in the same way as we can use our strength or our intellect or our sexuality or whatever. Thank you, Steve. Um, any questions? I didn't have any. I used um, six pounds, which is about the equivalent of a hundred pounds. Um, I had no income for three years. I didn't draw expenses um, until two years. So I really was from a completely bottom-up approach. I didn't know anything about business, so nobody had told me that you needed capital. And I don't think anyone would have given me any given me money anyway, if I'd asked. Um, eventually, um, my mother, who, with whom I was reunited, um, she lent me 200 pounds, which again, would be about 2,000 pounds an hour. Very, very modest. And if I can talk about the sort of slow development of a business, this is a successful business. I've been earning 2,000 pounds, so you just get the idea. And then the first year, the business turned over 700 pounds, so less than I'd been earning. Second year was 17, still less than I'd been earning as an employee. And then it started to climb. And after 25 years, it became a big, big success. And I had a different sort of problem. How do I use the money that I and my staff have made? When we, the company was eventually taken over by a French software house, it had seven and a half thousand employees. They got very big. And one of the things about business is that I loved it when it was small. But the more successful it was, the less I could contribute. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm not really a corporate manager. And the more successful it was, the less I could contribute, and the less I enjoyed.
enjoy that. So I've gone in and I love software. Such fun. And that's how business should be. Straight fun. Any more questions, please? Uh, just to ask, what motivates you after you sold your first business to actually go and start another one? Okay. I'm sorry, again, I have So to... after you sold your business, because most people have the dream that they want to make a lot of money and they get to that stage where they make money. So how do you then motivate yourself to then carry on doing uh, more interesting things? Well, I'm not sure that a business has to be sold. It, it's a lifestyle. It's a way of living that allows you to be very free. Um, you can decide how and when and what to work on. Um, when I sold the business, I'd already been wealthy on paper for a long time. And there's something called paper money that um, when I needed a lot of money for, for our son, um, I was already a multi-millionaire. But it was all in, tied up in the company and I had to sell bits of the company in order to sponsor, sponsor my very, very vulnerable child. So it went in different ways. And just thinking, and I met Bill Gates, for example, and I, I chaired him in, in a delivery company uh, lecture. And when he arrived, he was, that's a long time ago now, um, but he was so intense about the business. He didn't talk in terms of um, how many millions he had already made or how many, but he was talking about what computers could do and, and value to society and um, what he, he was thinking into, also in terms of his legacy, what he would do when he really did start to dispose of the, the business. And a remarkable man, really quite a privilege to meet him. And um, that's how many entrepreneurs are. We're different. We do things our way, we do things in a new way. I sometimes think I've tried new things because I haven't been taught. I didn't have a good education like you, and so I didn't know what you were supposed to do and what you weren't supposed to do, and so I just went ahead and did it. And that's the thing. Thank you, Sarah. That, that's a fascinating point about the passion for the underlying of uh, the plan, um, the money. Um, about three or four years ago when I was um, working as a group chief information officer of an international law firm, I met Michael Dell. Now Michael Dell makes little computers, they make very large computers and they make very small computers and the smallest thing they made at that time was something called the Dell Street, which is a smartphone. And they'd given each of the CIOs who was at this conference um, a Dell Street. And it just so happened I was talking to him and I said, I've got my nail street out. He then spent half an hour telling me how to get the most out of the cheapest product he made. And his passion for the product, yeah, bearing in mind this man is seriously wealthy, but the money is not what he's about. That's why he cares about being successful. Any more questions, please? John. In the, in, I was brought up in the, in the 1960s. I don't remember seeing a computer until uh, I, was, I was at university, um, which was um, in the late 1970s. Um, so I just wondered where you got your idea for your business from and, and, and why you thought it was going to work. Well, I didn't know it was going to work. I didn't even, it was just a big, big gamble. And the idea, where do ideas come from? Where does innovation come from? And, and nobody really knows the answer. I know that the more you know about the subject and the more work you put in, the more ideas come. They, to me, they just come up at night and I wake up in the morning and think, I wonder about that. Now, most of them are, are, are no good. But the good ideas you can then start to implement. The computers in 1963, when I started the company, which was in a sense a, a reaction against the glass ceiling that I which had come across at school, coming across in, in um, the employment field, um, was just so exciting that I could hardly wait 
to serve out my notice and get started on the business. But I didn't know it was going to be a success. Nobody does. Um, one of the things about entrepreneurs is that we are remembered for our successes. I've set up four organizations that are all running without me. Um, I've done all sorts of things. Um, but the, in fact, it's the failures that I remember. How did I take this awful time when? Blah, 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 blah. And um, entrepreneurs and success comes as much from how we deal with failures than how we the number of successes that we've got. Any questions about that? And does that make sense to you? Let me ask a question, if I may, uh, whilst you reflect on that. Um, so, Steve, you are clearly very passionate about autism-related research, and you've set yourself um, some very demanding targets. Um, can you talk to us? Now, one of the things I've realized is that autism is far more prevalent than most people think. So, Steve had a severely autistic son. I have an autistic 14-year-old. Uh, three others who are not autistic. And more and more when I talk to people, they say, oh yes, either I have somebody in the family or I know somebody who has. So I think this is likely to be relevant, if not directly then, through people you know. So tell me a bit about the work that's going on and the sorts of targets and how close they are to being met. At the moment, the estimates are that one in a hundred children are on the autistic spectrum. That is may be very bright, something called Asperger's, or it may be like my son with learning disability, epilepsy, and without speech. Um, in the States, they've measured it somewhat more accurately, and they're talking about one in 77. So autism is something that's very much part of everyday life, and the work that I've been trying to do has, over the years, dealt with the care and support of people who are not able to look after themselves. The education, I set up a special school which has now 300 staff. How's that compare with you? I've got 300 staff in a school because it's all special education, very high staff um, to pupil ratio all the time. Um, in Autism Cymru, which is in Wales, we've got this bilingual country. Uh, which is particularly difficult for um, children with communication problems. And so I've set up a lobbying group then. The last thing I've done is um, set up a research charity, which is really targeted to fund research into the courses. The thing that I'm doing next week, and I'm always, you know, I am always looking at what's the next thing? What have I built on what I've done? Um, I'm going over to Dublin as it happens, and there's an organisation that has started that it's asked for sort of help. Um, and the target there is to get a million adults with Asperger syndrome into employment in the IT industry by 2020. And so that's the sort of large scale scope that I think can make a little bit of difference. I've got a few years left. Thank you. Now, I'm getting very close to the point where I'm going to have to ask my final question, but before I do that, um, are there any last questions you'd like to ask? And please don't be shy. I'm amazed that you haven't got questions. And, you know, a lot of you are doing IT, studying IT, and you've had an interest in IT. Lots of you are doing business got an interest in business, you may be interested in setting up your own business or getting um, ideas of, or tips about how to set up your business um, from, from somebody who's, who's had massive experience of it. You know, I think you, there's a really good opportunity for you to, to ask questions which are going to help you in your, in your coursework, in your exams, etc. And indeed, if you think about setting up a business, in your, in your future life. So, why you think about that, I have a question on the back. So, you obviously faced a lot of different adversities, obviously being a refugee and being um, 
trying to set up a business as a woman back in those times, what was sort of, apart from changing your name, what were the other sort of strategies that you used to sort of overcome those difficulties? Well, when there's a sort of great big fence in front of you, there are various strategies you can try and just beat your way through, and just try and get around and obviate the problem and do something different in a different way, or you can climb over it. You can team up with other people and have a great big crash at that fence to, to, to break it through. And it's always a combination of those things. Mm -hmm. You can't do many things on your own. You have to do it as a team with other people. The number of things that you can do with your own, maybe you can have an idea on your own, but the rest has to be teamwork. And so you always need to work with people that you like, um, that you can have a bit of fun with, that you trust because it's that team that's going to make the difference. Not just my skills or your skills, it's going to be the combination that make, drives the business forward. Thank you. We have time for one question, and then I'm going to ask my question if I may. Right, well I'll ask my question, and then if a question does occur to somebody, that's the time of the time is up, nearly. Um, so, Steve, I was watching this morning whilst doing my hours, mandatory exercise, because I'm at the age where if I don't exercise, the body stops working. And they were advertising the proms, and in particular, the Dalek proms, or the Dr. Houthi proms, with the Dalek popping up, interrupting the music and saying, we have gone back in time and captured Sir Henry Wood. So, I'm now going to be invite you to imagine that you, you can go back in time and do something which time travelers are not supposed to be able to do, which is speak to your younger self. So you go back as you are now, two weeks, or is it two months of being 80, and talk to your younger self at the same age as these people, so around 18, I guess, is the 17, 18. Um, and just give yourself one bit of advice. So with the benefit of all these years of wisdom and experience and having lived a, a, a rich and varied life, you go back, you, you talk to yourself and you hope you will listen to yourself. What's that bit of advice that you would give yourself? Well, it's not obvious, but when I think about it, it has to be belief that if I want to do something, I can. It may be difficult, I may be take me a long time, but if I want to do it, I can, and I'm jolly well going to do it. And I hope you guys do the same. We will have a few minutes for any of you who want to stay behind and have a more intimate discussion with Steve, so rather than sitting in rows, um, anybody who's got a particular interest in IT or business, and as John said, I'm surprised Steve didn't say, don't be shy, in terms of asking questions. So don't be shy if you want to stay behind and have a discussion. Then it's not gonna be sitting down, it's gonna be, come over here, we'll all stand in a circle and have a chat. If, however, you want to go out and enjoy the sunshine, then I think we'll perfectly understand. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that the message I got from that is that it doesn't matter what your background is, what your hardships you face, you can and everybody can achieve if they are motivated, if they put their mind to it, if they put all their efforts into it, then anything is possible. So, that is something that you need to be doing in your time at Lillian Bailey's now and in your future. You've got to, you need to set yourself goals and then work towards those goals and put everything you've got in to achieving those goals because that is how you're going to be successful. On the way, you will fail, but learn from those failures. Don't give up and use those as a further driving force to achieve the ultimate goal that you've set yourself. So, once again, thank you. Thank you.